to take to become that badly damaged by it? Well, crystal meth, it, it, it has, um, you know, it's basically poison and it affected my nerve system. You took so much meth that affected your nervous system? <laughs> yeah, it affects your nerve system and I have, uh, your receptors are going like, so movements fast and I have, like, jaw movements that, that, uh, is acting up in my body. Crystal meth, what happens is, it deteriorates your teeth, right? Can you show us your teeth? It rottens up your teeth and it gets, it, it actually just tears them all up, see? So tears them all up. The see? Tears them all up. I was in Fresno, California, on the trail of the world's most abused hard drug. You're up so high, you're spinning like a kite, you're biting your teeth, you're grinding them because you don't even know what your body's doing. Um, your eyes are going 100 miles an hour in every direction. What is it? Crystal meth. Methamphetamine, or crystal meth, is a derivative of speed. Cheap and easy to produce, it can be devastating for those who get addicted. Face the other way. Face away from me. I hate that. I hate not being clean, but I hate being clean. You know, I'm messed up by using again. I was hoping to understand the hold the drug exerts over its users by spending time in the world of the hardcore addicts. Does it look tempting, Louis? Huh? Does it look tempting? And so I'd come to one of the worst affected areas in America. Sam, what's your location? On the front line of Fresno's meth problem are the city police. Copy, 2 Sam 11. Where are we now? Pretty much exactly downtown Fresno. How much of the crime you see is meth related? Half or maybe even more. Everybody knows somebody that's got a family or member or friend or relative that somehow has been impacted by narcotics. Everything from uh, domestic violence, child abuse, property crimes, theft, Vehicle burglaries. A lot of activity here. In fact, this one's now vacant. This one's now vacant. Gang activity, drugs. We had a shooting here. We had a stabbing here. One of the first spots we hit, an apartment belonging to the sister of a suspected dealer in a complex that was well known to the police. OK, you guys come in. Thank you. It's quite rough in here, isn't it? This is this is typical for a drug house. Um, drug, addiction, users that come around, um, people dealing out of here. I think it's just the people that come. Um, she just uh, vulnerable to them and lets them in, and then they start either using here. What's sad is I think there are kids living here too, aren't there? Yes. Three kids. Three kids? Yeah, I think the yeah. smallest one's under five. Just the conditions that this place is in, that's not enough to notify social services? Mm, no. She has food in the refrigerator. Other than the mess, I mean, it doesn't pose a hazard. It, it's, just, it's just messy. On the other side of the city, a car pulled over for a minor violation contained a woman acting strangely and some friends. Anything interesting? We got some uh, pipe scales, some dope. What kind of dope is it? Meth. It's meth. They got meth on them. <laughs> <laughs> it was the first thing. <laughs> What's so <I> funny? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Everything's funny. Uh, is there already a warrant out for her? <laughs> Arrested? Someone said. <laughs> what are you under arrest for? <laughs> We're not going to court. <laughs> what, what's your warrant for? For <laughs> drugs. <laughs> what is it? It's a methamphetamine pipe. What is it? <laughs> How much a uh, small bag like that cost? About ten dollars. What was his original offense? The guy in the back. Possession for sales. So this guy so, could yeah. be a dealer. You did time in prison for uh, for dealing meth. So dealing drugs, meth. You were taking it as well. Yeah, pretty much. I've been on a good little run. How come you got so caught up in meth? You smoke that shit and it's over, man. You know, I've snorted cocaine, I've done meth, I've done crank, I've done it, snorted it, and I took a hit of some meth, and it's pretty much a wrap. You smoke about a gram a day? Sure do. Maybe more. Really? Yes. What, you smoke every day? Every day. How come? Because I want to, because I feel like it. 
For how long have you been doing this? <laughs> Since 1995. And you have three kids? Yes, I do. Do they know that you, that you get high every day? <laughs> yes, they do. Most likely, yes, they do, because their grandparents tell them everything. I left that house to just come out here and do whatever I want to do. Is that because of the drugs you use? Nope, or? not even because of that. Because because my baby's dad freaking left me, and I couldn't stay in that house no more because of the fact it brought too many fucking memories inside my inside. Still care for your children, right? <laughs> Who wouldn't? Do you think about your children when yes, you're, I do when you're getting day, high? Yes, I do every day, every day. And that's why I get high, because I just want that fucking pain to go away. <laughs> I, mean, I don't care if you're going to believe me or not, but after today, I wasn't going to smoke no more at all, because I was going to come go fucking do everything I was supposed to do and everything after today. I don't care if you believe me or not, but that's the truth. <laughs> And it's all in my, it's all I have to do is just fucking want to stop and that's all I have to do is just want to stop. How old are your children? 13, 6, and 4. Watch your head as you get in. I was curious to meet more addicts and to try to understand the appeal of the meth lifestyle. Given the scale of the drug problem in Fresno, it's perhaps not surprising that the city is also home to the largest rehab facility in the state of California. It's run by a company called Westcare. Many of the addicts here have been sent by the courts as an alternative to a jail term. They live segregated by sex. A majority have a problem with meth. I'm writing you this letter to say goodbye to meth. You have made my life hell and have destroyed my life for the last time. Recently, there's been a surge in the numbers of addicted women. One of the side effects of meth is unbridled sexual activity, and many of the women are mothers to large numbers of children. Westcare deputy administrator is Lynn Pimentel. How many, um, how many people do you have in residence here in recovery total? We're licensed for 299 adults and 55 children. The children aren't addicted to drugs. Some are born addicted, Some yes. Some are born addicted, yes. really? How do you know? They're, they test the, at birth, they test the urine and they test the mother. We have a lot of problems in the valley with poverty, unemployment, crime. Myth is very accessible and it kind of takes the pain away for folks and it makes them feel good. Epidemic, growing, easily manufactured, very cheap and spreading across the country. So the pathways for women are very different. Women's pathways to addiction tend to come through relationships um, to develop a connection with another human being. Men's pathways what, so a husband or a boyfriend? Boyfriend, husband, father, mm -hmm. a molester, an abuser. 95% of the individuals, that w the women that walk in here, test positive for mental health disorders, either depression, anxiety, compulsive behavior. 85% ha have been a victims of sexual, physical, or emotional abuse. Men know who their enemies are and who want to hurt them. They're gangs, they're, they're the police, they're enemy in war. Women tend to be abused and, and hurt by those who say, I love you. So it's very crazy making. Um, so we treat the men different than the women. They have to learn how to express themselves. Women have no problems expressing themselves. It's what they do with it is the problem. Good morning, ladies. I'm Janice. Hi, um, Janice. I woke up feeling um, mischievous today. Um, something good about me is I'm a good mom, good daughter, good friend, loyal friend. I'm clean and sober today, and I love my children and grandchildren. <laughs> something good about me is I'm still here. I'm still trying. I'm still willing to get help. One of those coming close to the end of her stay at Westcare was a recovering addict and convicted meth manufacturer called Sentika. 
so you're on a, a relatively short... The short-term program short -term here, program. Uh, which is 30 days. And you had done some time in jail? Yes. How long? Um, this last time, um, seven months. Seven months? Mm -hmm. And you'd done a, another sentence before that? Yeah, four that? months. And see, I was looking at, um, I was looking at about eight to ten years prison. It sounds like you, you uh, at one point had been kind of quite deep into the meth lifestyle. Right. Is that, is that fair to say? Yeah, how, very much, for 15 years. How much, how often would you take it? <sighs> when I was snorting it, it, was, it wasn't as much. I could do a 20 sack, which is, you know, um, it's small. $20. Twenty dollars worth. But then when I started smoking it, it became to be like almost like I'm smoking a cigarette. Okay, and I'm like, so every time I get up out of bed, I wanted to smoke a bowl. I mean, did you ever go on benches where you were staying up? Yeah, a I long did. Time? How long would you stay? The up longest for? I stayed up was two weeks. Without sleeping. Without sleeping, and I was just like, I mean, seeing things. <laughs> I mean, it was off the wall. Did you like it? I did, cause it was different. And what would you be doing when you were on these long binges? I mean, just socializing or what? No, I would I would be by myself most of the time. On your own? Not even with yeah, a boyfriend? I, no, I was more of a, um, I feel like I wanted to do it so I can get stuff done. Clean, you know, get the house all clean, you know, thinking I'm getting it done. But I'm really only stuck in one spot for friggin' five or six hours. Cleaning one thing. <laughs> and you have kids, right? Right. How many? I have five girls. Where are they? Um, four of them are in CPS. Child Protective Services? Right. And the other one? And the other one is with her dad. It was more important to you at that stage at to that, get, at to that get stage. higher than, to, than, right. than to be with your children? Right. I guess you could say I chose the dope at that moment over my children, but I felt that I was doing the best for them at that time. And, you know, I just, I didn't think that I had anywhere to go with them. Who are you with now? I'm still kind of with my children's father, um, but he's still he's still in his in his addiction, and I know I cannot when I leave this program I can't go to him if he is still using it because I cannot jeopardize my sobriety again I can't or I'm not I, I might not come back again I might go out and I not make it back. There is that there is that chance. Meaning? Um, death, death, jails, institutions, and death. Roughly half a million people live in Fresno. Historically, it was an agricultural center, but for years the city has struggled with unemployment, and the recent downturn has only made the situation worse. Some say people take meth to help them work longer hours in boring jobs, others simply to escape their problems. I wanted to get to know some active addicts. Being illegal, the use of meth is highly secretive, but I'd heard about a weekly needle exchange program supported by Westcare. It would be a way to meet users who take their drugs by injecting them, also known as slamming. What's your name? Carl. Carl, how do you do? I'm Louis. And you got a problem with meth, would you say? Yeah. Meth, uh, shards, whatever they want to call it anymore. I've been doing it for 35 years. Really? I slam three or four times a day, every day. And I eat, sleep every day. You know, take vitamins, take care of myself. And, you know, sure, it's affected my life some, but I have a wife. We've been together 20-something years. Does your wife use as well? Yes, she does. How often does your wife use? Same thing as I do. Three or four times a but day? She just smokes, you know, slam. Really? Mm hmm in money terms, how much are you using a day? Probably $100 a day. That's $700 a week. Mm -hmm. about 400 pounds a week or more. Uh, I used That's to, a lot. You know, yeah, I went through it. When did you last shoot up? About an hour ago. You don't seem that high. No, no, well, no, just, uh, it's how you do it. Uh, I don't care if I've just done one. If I need to, I can be as straight as the next person. Did you have children? I have five boys. Five they, boys? Mm -hmm. But they're not with us. They live with her brother. Wouldn't you like them to be with you? Uh, uh, well, I'm smart and yeah, I would, but then again, I'm not going to jeopardize my children over my choices. It sounds like you chose your drug over your children, in a sense. Uh, no, I chose the fact that I love my children enough not to let them get involved with me around it. 
Have you ever thought of going into West Care? You know, they have these um, inpatient uh, facilities. You know, the thing about I don't, uh, rehab stuff will not do anybody any good that's not already ready to quit. And if you're already ready to quit, you don't need any rehab, okay? They can't help. Yeah, I plan on, when I'm 90 years old, my wheelchair be rolling down the aisle and boom, do a big one, and that's it. Blow my heart out. That'd be all over with. As long as it's in my wife's arms, you know, that's only, I just want to die in her arms. Other than that, I don't care. I was back with law enforcement, this time the sheriff's department. The rural parts of Fresno County are well known for hiding clandestine labs where meth is cooked up using an over-the-counter cold remedy. Even the small towns have large numbers of meth addicts. So where, what are we doing? What they're doing right now is they've got a UC car that's set up on a residence. That's undercover? Yeah, an undercover car that's... Okay, I'm set up in a church parking lot, almost caddy corner from the house. Stand by. They're looking for an escapee. He's a 18-year-old escapee. Uh, there's a warrant, a no-bail warrant out for his arrest. You only see the front door and the front of the house. I can't see down the street. I can't see anything else. I'm kind of looking over a fence. Let's just uh, get this one crossed off the list. So what's happening? They're going to hit the house. Okay, yeah. Best way in there is either off of I think that's our primary. He's walking back towards me. How do you do? I'm Louie. We're from the BBC British Broadcasting. Do you know why they've come for you today? Ditching her dope in the scale. My goodness. Scales? What kind of drug was it? Uh, it's methamphetamine. You can see it here. It's a nice size rock. What is it? Crystal meth. Yeah. Brett, go to the dip here. Yeah, my car's right there. How are you doing? I'm Louie. I know that we What's your name? My name is Barbara. I'm Brett's grandmother. Brett is the very tall, skinny young man yes. who was the guy they were looking for, basically. Yes, he had a warrant, which I was unaware of. He's got a problem with crystal meth? I guess. And his mother too? She has it. She had it in the past, yes. Really? But she's been out she's been out and off parole now for over four years. It sounds like meth's been a problem in your family. Yes. My daughter, she left me with Brett. Brett was four years old when she was doing drugs. I've given probably the last nineteen years of my life uh, help raising my grandchildren so that they don't wind up in they don't wind up with CPS and they don't wind up in well, and look at look at poor Brett, you know. <laughs> just breaks my heart to see him have to, to try and walk through his mother's footprints that she did for so long. You think Brett got off track because of mistakes that your daughter, his mother, made? I think it contributed to it, yes. Watching mom out on the streets and, and leaving him alone. Because of the drugs? Leaving him with family, family and friends, not having a mother and a father being shuffled between families and his dad serving 25 years for premeditated murder in Washington. Back in Fresno, I was hoping to get deeper into the meth lifestyle. I'd met up with an ex-dealer called Kevin. 
he told me that one of his best friends, Chris, was a serious meth head. And what is your what is your routine? What do you what do you do together? Um, make money. Uh, really, I'm like his manager. He gets stuff, and then he brings it to me. I tell him what it's worth, and then I sell it for him. It's sort of uh, on the fringes of of legality, as it were. Uh, I don't understand. Come stolen goods. Yeah. I don't want to put you on the spot, Kevin. But would you say that you're a criminal? Nah. Hey, Kevin. Louis. How you doing? Hello. Louis. Hello. What's your name? Chris. Chris, nice to meet you. A little later, with Chris on board, we headed back to Kevin's house. Hi, how do you do? I'm Louis. A few of his friends were having a barbecue. Hi. So this is your place? Yeah. And are those your kids? What time do they normally turn in? Whenever they want. For real? Really? Do you don't find it makes them cranky if uh, if they haven't sort of had a good night's sleep? <laughs> Basically, they gotta adapt to their parents' schedule because I mean, we can't be asleep when they're up. So, fellas, get out of the window. One of those present was a meth dealer with an unusual nickname. This is Wiggles. Yes. Nice yeah. to meet you, I'm Louis. Yeah. How's it going? Very good. You also go by Andrew, is that right? That's your yeah, name. Yeah. Andrew, you use a bit. Quite a lot. Yeah. Quite a lot. Where do you get it from? My, my peoples. You know what I mean? Your connection? Yeah. You got a whole, you know what I'm saying? Bunches of them. So. From people who are cooking it themselves? Oh, no, I don't fuck around with cooks, man. They're crazy. Why? Because they cook it, so like they. Inhale the fumes and stuff, they're not quite right in the head, so kind of like, you know, stay away from them. I mean, the, the meth that's sold in Fresno, would it be mainly cooked around here or in California? Or is it brought. Fresno's the meth oh, capital yeah. of the motherfucking yeah, yeah. world. Yeah. You know? My dad used to do, push it with the Hells Angels back in like, the 70s and shit, so here in Fresno and whatnot. Do you think Andrew's use is, is like, do you think it's had a mental yeah. effect on him? Oh, well, uh, yeah. I think it has an effect on every, everybody, anyone who does it. I've been doing it since I was 11. Of course, it's had its effect, too. Yeah. Since you were 11? Yeah. So, uh, Louis? Yo. I'm going to take another break. OK. I'll be right back. OK. <laughs> All right. Figure out where we left off. Chris had been taking occasional breaks all afternoon. I had a hunch they might be meth-related. I just did that. I just did that. This time, Andrew joined him. For me, it was an awkward moment. Though I'd wanted to experience the depths of the meth lifestyle, I hadn't thought much about what I'd do when I got there. Does it look tempting, Louis? Huh? Does it look tempting? Do you feel different now, Andrew? Uh, about six more of those. Feel better, a little bit. Quick second, maybe more live, energetic. It's quite weird for me. On one level, I felt like I should be um, kind of challenging you and telling you not to do it. Do you know what I mean? It's just like somebody smoking a cigarette. You know what I mean? Cigarettes cause cancer. How many people die of cigarettes a year? You know what I mean? You seem a little tweaked now, is that the word? You know, you seem a little twitchier, like head movements and stuff. Yeah, I just got the camera on my face, and I don't know how to react. Where did they just come from, Kevin? Somebody's house. <laughs> <laughs> you don't mind if I sit down for a little? No, take a load off. Louis, man, you cool with me, man. Thank you, man. I don't, really I don't care what they say about me. <laughs> they better not say nothing about this guy. <laughs> <laughs> See, got, got a problem with all of us. Get pass. It was close to midnight, and for me, bedtime. 
The most troubling part of the evening had been the presence of children. Though I was fairly sure they hadn't seen any drug use, I still felt I should talk to Kevin. Do you ever worry um, about, you know, the, the lifestyle that, say, your, your friends are involved in and your kids being around it? No, like, I think there's a lot of... Bubba's, go inside. Bubba's. It seems to me there's a danger here that they could be exposed to some of the chaos, you know, that goes with the lifestyle. I don't know. Because Chris and, and, and Andrew and... They're relaxing in there with your, with your children, toddlers. Yeah, if anything, they'll, they'll uh, help keep them safe. If any trouble did come, they would, you know, all in together. You know what I mean? Do you feel I'm being judgmental? Kind of. Yeah. Maybe a little. You got to live the life for a minute. Really see. You know, you just got a kind of quick glimpse and. Really, is it the night the the better side? Like it gets a whole lot worse. I tell you, I've been a lot of places. It gets a whole lot worse. I was heading back to Westcare. As a way of understanding the importance of family support to recovery, I've been invited to observe a therapeutic exercise called the hot seat. Clients and their family members would be facing off in public in the hope of repairing their relationships. One of those taking part was a recovering meth addict called Leanne. So how many times have you been in recovery inpatient? This is my fourth, fifth. Fifth. Do you think you can do it? I'm gonna try. I think I got, I'm gonna get more tools now. And I know what the big issue on me relapsing was because I have five kids and I lost them all. They're all adopted. And I'm still not getting over the fact that I lost them, I think. But it's been 17 years. So I'm not gonna say never. <laughs> Is there a man in your life? Yeah, I just got married. <laughs> when? Uh, a year ago, October. How's that going? The day we got married, I relapsed. So our new, our, the night we got married, that night I took off and I didn't come home for four days. It's supposed to be the best day of your life, right? When you get married and then yeah. the evening, you couldn't even stick it out for the whole day? I didn't go thinking I wasn't going to come home. I went to go get high and then I was going to come home. But I didn't come home because once I got high, I got guilty. You didn't come back for three days, did you say? How, how, how three days, but it's, this is, that was the first time. It's only been four more times after that that I've took off on him. So I am very blessed that he's still there. And you've only been married a, a little over a year. A year and two months. So your track record is not that good. <laughs> no, no. I wouldn't say so. I'm good with that today, though. feeling? Uh, I was like nervous. Nervous. Why? Well, you think he's going to give you, you think he's going to grill you? I don't know. At this point in time, I do not know. This is not a joke. Amen. Addiction is not a joke. It's, it's killing people. It's robbing children of their mothers and their fathers. It's robbing you of your family, your life, you lose yourself in this addiction. But you know, I'm just happy to say, you are beautiful women in recovery today. And this is where you make a change in your life. I'm not going home and do all my old behavior again. I've told you that. I don't want you involved in my life anymore. I don't want nothing because all you're doing is bringing me down. Your way of dealing with things is to disappear, not answer the phone, and then when you, afterwards, 
you'd pick up the phone and say, hey, you know, how you doing? Uh, you know, like, like nothing happened. I'm sorry. I, that's the part I was telling you. I was sorry about that. I did all those <coughs> things to you. I put you off. I put you second, and I put Mikey second, and I'm not going to put you guys second anymore. All right. Okay. We got married a year and two months. And our honeymoon, supposedly, AKA, next day he ran off. I left at 5.45 for work, and he was gone at 6.30. Like that. <coughs> you hurt people that care about you. You understand? I understand. I can't live two lives. Am I pushing you out there? No. Am I making it too easy for you? Is that what it is? Sometimes it was. And you was. Most of the times we are. Too easy for you. Yeah. I love you. Love you too. <laughs> The other recovering addict I'd met at Westcare, Sentika, was back at home and living with her boyfriend, who also had a meth problem. She'd allowed me to tag along at her monthly visit with the one daughter she still had contact with. She was belatedly giving her a Christmas present. Have you noticed changes in your mum? Yeah. Since she came out of Westcare? Yes. I know she's doing better and she's trying harder to get her, me and my sisters back. I know that. And then when she does, she's going to stay better. How do you know that? Because she's Santika. She's my mom. I just, my mom's a strong person. She's always been a strong person. That's just the kind of person my mom is. I know you're, you're only 15, and so there's things you wouldn't have been aware of, but did you have a sense that, you know, you, that your mom had a substance abuse problem? People tried telling me that you were. I wouldn't believe them, but in my mind, like, in the back of my mind, I'm like, uh, I, I know my mom's probably doing it. She just doesn't want to tell me to hurt my feelings. I remember that one night uh, you left because you said you were going over to a store, but you never came home. So I, and I got scared, and and my sisters were all sleeping. So I got on the bike and rode over to Dwayne's and found you there. Remember? You don't remember that? Mm -hmm. You were asleep in the garage with them, and I and I said, Mom, Mom, here you. And like I'm like I found you. Oh yeah. I was only 11. Yeah, I left you guys. Home. I left you at home. It must be difficult for you staying clean if you live with someone who's not clean. Right. And I really think that he should go to a program because, you know, he drinks and I think he's using. He's, um, since I've been home, he's not there all the time. He's leaving. And I just can't go back to that kind of life. Have you used a toll since you, since you no. came out? No. Not even crossed my mind. Because all I picture is my girls. And I figure if every time I wanted to pick up that pipe before, I'd always see them saying, Mom, don't do it. Back in the world of active users, I'd been invited to see Carl, the addict I'd first met at the needle exchange. Hi. Are you Diane? I'd been struck by Carl saying he was still with his wife of 20 plus years. Carl told you how we met? Yes. At the needle exchange? Mm -hmm. And all that, we just painted the bathroom. I was curious to see what life was like for a couple who were heavily involved in meth use. But how do you bring income in? I clean houses for some church ladies I know. And right now, we're both full time students, so yeah. we have student loans. You're both in school at the moment? Mm -hmm. You're studying? What are you studying? I'm studying to be a drug counselor. Are you? Oops, a relapse. <laughs> hey, when that happens. Are you serious? Are you seriously are studying to be a drug counselor? Yeah. You're not clean at the moment, though. No. And how long were you using before that? Um, it's been about over 30 years. So basically, yeah. you get high um, every day? Oh, yeah. First thing in the morning, like when you get up? Mm -hmm. We get lucky maybe in the afternoon, but around nap time, we get to get high maybe. But usually at night, when we've taken care of all our responsibilities for the day, we get high in the evening. What is your criminal history? Extensive. <laughs> yes. I was an independent businesswoman. I used to sell $10,000, $20,000 worth of meth a week. 
You had periods where you were apart? For during, seven years. During incarceration. Oh, yeah. incarceration. Have you been incarcerated? Yeah, you bet. You what know? for? And by the time she was getting out, I got thrown in. She did three and a half, and I did three and a half, so that put us apart for seven years. We love being together, okay? I couldn't stand anybody well, else. You know, nobody else had put up yeah, with me, so. Yeah, I can't stand anybody else either, you know. I just love Nobody her. Nobody put up with him either. So. Hey, <laughs> it would too. Would you like to kick, kick the drug? Oh, I, I would give anything not to. I hate using. I mean, you like being high. I don't, well. Do you? At times. I don't like, I don't like being suicidal. <laughs> I don't like laying in my bed for three weeks at a time, not being able to get up and take a shower. I don't like that. You know, I don't like um, not feeling right, you know. I just, I just want to be able to function. And, you know, I'm a smart person. I have a lot to offer, and I, I love people, and I want to do things with my life. But no matter what the consequences are, you end up using again. We've been spending some time at West Care inpatient. The position they would take there is that you, you do have a, a choice. Okay. Yes. When you're active in your addiction, you don't have that choice. When you get clean for a while, then there is a choice. I may make bad choices, but I'm not a bad person, you know, and it's hard. There have been times in my addiction when, um, and I'm not proud of that, that, uh, you know, I, I turned to prostitution and uh, the things that I've had to do to survive and, and to support my drug habit. Carl, what, you know, how, how did you deal with that? that? She was safe while she was turning tricks. watched the door. You know? And that's sad Why? right there. Because it has nothing to do with my love for her. My and love because, for her. Be honest, be honest. And, and because we wanted to do it, you know, and we wanted the money at the time. I'm the ultimate recycler. Are you? Yes. Carl found this stuff out in the yard the other day. He said, man, that looks like a duck. And so I started putting that, I don't know, and like I made my curtains and. Did you do that? Yeah. Those are my boys. See, this was just a stick out of the yard. And you can see the faces that are in it. You whittled that? This is the first time I've I ever done that. that. That's my first curtain. one. I do all sorts of things. And she's excellent, all under everything in here. She sews herself. And this is where you spend a lot of time, too? Yeah, this is our, where we sit. Is that you? Yes. You had a little more meat on you. Yeah, that was before I relapsed. You were saying you don't keep more photos of your boys around for, <coughs> for what reason? It's hard. Why? When I was in prison, they would send me some pictures and I would see the pictures. It's just almost too much pain to bear, because. I mean, it's almost like I couldn't even breathe air because I missed everything so much. I would give anything to change a dirty diaper or clean up puke. I mean, I just loved being a mom so much. And you would think that after seven years that the pain would lessen and that um, you would get over it, but you never do. I'm not, I hate the quietness. I hate not having the chaos. That's why you came out to Fresno. Yeah. To be nearer the, the kids. And I did, and um, um, I was doing well. Sometimes a trigger can be doing poorly, and you'll, it's a trigger. Sometimes doing well can be a trigger for me. Sometimes money is a trigger for me. And that's kind of what happened is that, you know, we got this place and everything, and we had a couple of bucks, and I needed to clean the house, and uh, I, I lost my choice when I went and used again, you know. You needed to clean the house? So what's that got to do with... No, I needed the energy. You know, people drink coffee, I do meth, <laughs> you know. And um, I hate not, hate not being clean, but I hate being clean, you know. I'm messed up by using again. I was back out with the police. Is that your, your boyfriend, your husband? My husband. Your husband. By now, our patrols had become a nightly ritual of busts of the desperate and the addicted. Police department, come to the door. Many of them on meth. It's about 15, 20. The faces changed, but the stories had become familiar. I was in danger of becoming desensitized to the plight of the people I was seeing. 
right, John, go ahead and relax. I want you to do is follow my finger for me, okay? He's under arrest, Matt. What's his charge? Possession of methamphetamine. Possession of meth, okay. So wh where'd you get the meth from? Uh, one of my friends. You don't live around here. You don't live around here? Mm -hmm. How much did you pay for it? Uh, $10. How old are you? 16. You know it's illegal, right? Yes, sir. You know it's a felony? Yes, sir. Okay. Have you ever been arrested for any narcotics in the past, anything at all like that? No. I've been talking about the cops before, but I'm worried about arresting. Okay. You're a bit worried about what's going to happen? Yeah. Finger to one change. You're worried about your grandparents? Yeah, because I don't know what they're going to say. Do you live with your grandparents? Yes, sir. Where are your parents? Um, when I was little, my mom left me with my dad. And then my dad didn't have enough money to support me, so I just stayed with my grandparents my whole life. Been with them since I was a baby. And you're worried about what they're going to think when they find out you've been arrested? Yeah. What do you think they will think? I don't know. They're probably going to be disappointed and mad. Disappointed and mad? Yeah. Upset? Yeah. Hey, John, follow me, buddy. What's your sense of what's going to happen in the next five, ten years? That's a kind of a scary thought. I, it's kind of like a plague on this generation that you see that so many people are getting addicted. And uh, in the last few years, I'd say the majority of the ones that we're seeing are, are meth. Meth is the uh, primary drug of choice. It almost seems like uh, it, it's family and kids are getting involved now, and, and parents aren't allowing it. And, it just seems to be so many people are, are getting addicted to the drug and not, not as many are getting, you know, turned around and, and going the other way. They're, they're addicted and they continue to want that lifestyle. I was on the way back from my last patrol when Sergeant Tijan made a stop that was unlike anything I'd seen before. Uh, first in Tulare with uh, Domestic in front of the AMPM. What's going on? You guys having a little argument or something? No, we're just talking. Do me a favor, come over here for me. Keep your hand on top of your head. A man high on meth and armed with a knife had been having a rowdy argument in a parking lot with his sister. Has he hit you? Has he hurt you or anything? No. Has he hit you in the past? Yeah. Yeah? When he gets high, does he get violent? Yes? I don't have to admit to nothing. I have the right to remain silent. Okay. Dennis is your brother? Yeah. Am I right in thinking you've been using meth this evening? Do you use occasionally or quite a bit? I've been trying to quit. When he's used in the past, he's been uh, he's been violent to you sometimes. Yeah. I left in an ambulance last night. Also on the scene was the man's wife. You said he never was violent with you, but now I notice that you have a restraining order. Yeah, it wasn't a violent restraining order. Well, what was wanted, the purpose for the restraining order? I wanted them out of the house. They were sleeping together. Who? Him or her. And his sister? Okay, so how long has that been going on? Two, maybe going on two and a half years. How did you become aware of that? Well, they probably told me. Dennis and his sister have been sleeping together? Yeah. He said in his head that he was supposed to be with his sister, so I really don't know what was in his mind. He told you that he was meant to be with his sister sexually? He told you that? Well, I found it out after uh, they were sort of staying in the other room. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of a crazy thing to say, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I don't know what possessed him. Is there a history of meth in their family? I think it's my father and son. Anna and Dennis's father had a meth problem. It was a strange parting moment to my experience of families destroyed by meth. The next day, and I was heading back to Westcare for a final catch up with Lynn.
has it been going here at West Cairn? It's been kind of rocky. People must be suffering from spring fever because we've had a real outbreak of relapse, going out and using, coming back, um, asking to be readmitted. Um, we had a death. Um, Did you? Not in the program, but a child of one of our mothers who is struggling with um, respiratory problems and birth defects passed away at three months, and that was last week. We had the funeral yesterday. That's very sad. It was very sad. I get goosebumps. When you get upset about that, what are you thinking about? What a tragedy that it didn't have to happen, that there's education, there's services, there's prevention, that, you know, our hope is that the CB plan here avoids it in the future. Maybe that baby had to die so some other mother who's using right now won't. It's tough. Yeah. Anyone yeah. here got a problem with meth? Meth is a devil's drug. That's, that's all I said. It's just, it's evil, it's bad. I mean, I'm 23 years old, I've already been to prison twice behind it, it's horrible. It takes your freedom. It takes your self-respect. It takes your self-respect. It takes respect. anything positive you ever had. What do you think it is that makes people recover? A lot of it has to do with a single incident in time, like having a, a a, a litter mate lose their baby. Mm. Um, others might be that finally they saw themselves in the mirror as they walked by a storefront and saw, oh my God, who is that person? Some folks come in here to avoid other things like prison and losing their children, and along the way they discover they're not such bad people mm. and they're pretty good company. So they decide to like themselves. Mm. And once you start liking yourself, you start feeling entitled to all the good things life has to give you. And so you'll do things like take good care of yourself and say, no, I'm not going to hang out with you. Or that methamphetamine is ruining my life, I'm going to stop. Would you say a, a majority don't? Um, no, I, I think you'll find as a, a national average, about 64% of folks that enter treatment successfully complete the treatment episode. How many of those stay seen, clean and sober is really unknown. Uh, from being with you, I know anecdotally that you see the same faces I coming do. in and coming in. I don't have a problem with something, someone coming in 14, 15 times. At least they're back here. Yes. Is it possible that it's not really about meth? It's about um, severely damaged people, people from traumatic backgrounds, and that they'll find something to medicate themselves with no matter what? Yes. I think you're right. The physical and the psychological addiction is much more potent than other drugs. Um, and because it's cheap, abundant, and rapidly and highly addictive, of course, that's why we have more of them. Uh, methamphetamine, the, the rapid spread, the rapid addiction, the rapid destruction of families, the rapid growth in criminal behavior to support the drug habit is measurable. You've seen it in the last decade. And the question of why goes back to availability. It's very easy to cook in your kitchen. Therefore, I can cook it, sell it, make some money, and, and take care of my family. And then it takes care of you. My time among the addicts in Fresno was nearly up. But before I left, I tracked down a few of the people I'd met during my stay. Santika I found back behind bars at the Madeira County Jail. So, what, so what's the story? Um, well, when I left the program, when I saw you guys, yeah. um, well, that Thursday, um, I got high. Really? Yeah. Were you high when we saw you? No. I, was, I, won't, go, I won't be high to go see my daughter. That day, though? Why? You don't wake up just saying, you just, I don't know, you don't wake up saying you're going to get high, you just do it, I guess. I don't know, for me, I just do it, because I liked it. And it's not that I don't want my kids or anything, it's that I like to get high. That's the problem. And it's the problem of not wanting to like it, but you just do. I just do. You had also said that living with your boyfriend while he was using was going to be a challenge for right. you. Right. So maybe that was the obstacle. Well, I pretty much set myself up for failure, didn't I? Um, but like I said, I guess I did, because at that moment, I didn't have nowhere else to go. Um, and he had come to visit me, thinking that, you know, it's all going to be OK. We're not, I'm not going to use either. Well, it didn't change. You really love him? <laughs> I don't know. Because I don't know if he's going to change. So, I mean, if I go back to him, then he's just to be my enab enabler, and I'm going to use again. 
I'm, I won't change it on the Rima Kids back. So. It's definitely open to you to go back into recovery. That, that road is still, they're not going to say no, you've had no, enough chances. They, they just want to give me another chance, I guess. So they're giving me another chance at the program, but I have to do a year, at least up to a year program, which is fine. And hopefully it'll work this time. I'll try to make it work. <laughs> You know, I want my kids in my life, but it's just hard, you know? It's hard to quit. <laughs> Leanne, on the other hand, was back living with her husband. And by all appearances, making good progress. How have you been doing? Great. Are you clean? Yep. S 64 days today. You sure, Robert? Is she clean? <laughs> yeah. You sure? Yeah. How do you know? Hmm? 24 7. I am not going to lie, I have wanted to use twice since I've been home. But I was done, I'm done. My last appointment was with Carl and Diane. I'd arranged to meet Carl outside a pizza parlor near his house. You know, from our conversation last time, I had the sense that. In some ways, you are happier in your addiction than Diane is well, in I, hers. Being a girl, first off, she started off, you know, when she was only like 12 or 13, the people she was with, they would let the dealers rape her. Therefore, I haven't had to go through the things that she's had to go through, you know? And so, yeah, I, I have a whole lot better outlook. And being a mother that's doing drugs and Probably the consciousness or the reality of doing those drugs and how it affects you and your children and your life is probably more, I'm sure it's way more devastating on women than it is, say, like a man, okay? You think it's possible she'd be happier if she was clean? She hasn't reached that point yet where she's completely, totally committed to staying clean. I would throw everything away. I would throw it all out of my house today if she said, no more, be right is. here. Here she comes. There comes the love of my life. How are you doing? All right. Hi, sweetie. You to get in there. Come on in. Thank you. Throw stuff like that away. <laughs> Carl and I were just talking about this. Would you say, Diane, that you want recovery and you want sobriety more than Carl does? I would say that maybe. Probably. Maybe, maybe yeah. And at the same time, perhaps, you're not ready. It's embarrassing because um, I know I'm stronger and better than that. It's just, it's really a cop out using. It is. But if I was to quit the destructive behavior, I could, things could be so much better. How could your life be better, do you think? Oh, I could have a big old five bedroom house with all my boys in it, you know, sending them all off to college and being able to get a car for my son that's fixing to get his driver's license, you know, just all those things, any aspirations that most people have, you know. You don't share Diane's idea that, you, you know, your lives could be so much more than what they are now? I'm sure it would be. But then again, if I wasn't doing dope, it would be better in certain ways, but then again, you cannot give me that guarantee, you can't give me that promise that if I quit doing dope, my life's gonna get better. You can't make that call. I can't make that call. She can't make that call. So You'll never why? know, though. You'll never you know, know unless you yeah, do it. Exactly. But I have done it before. And was your life better? Yeah, I guess. Well, that didn't, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, he better. swims in a river of denial. Does it? Yeah. Do you think if you did make the, the jump and, and um, decided to quit and stay clean. Are you confident Carl would go with you and support mm -hmm. you? Oh, yeah, he wouldn't use behind my back or anything like that. No way. So it's just waiting for you to make the change. You can't sit there and, you know, put, put off my choices on him. Oh, it's because of him that I do this. Realistically, I'm not making that choice. My choice is, is using right now, and, you know, that's on me. I can't put that on anybody else. Is it possible that your life is, is kind of OK now? Oh, it's wonderful. You know what I mean? Our, our life is great. It seems very nice. It is, it is. But it could be so much more. It's not always roses for us, you know, 
considering what all we've been through and everything else, but, you know, I do love her with all my heart. We've been together 20 years. You know, I wouldn't trade her. Uh, she's mine, all mine. You know, you know, win, lose, draw, whatever. She's mine. You know, I'm happy. I'm, you know, I'm more content right now with life, with her being in my life. Nothing else matters. Not really. Nothing. Kid, I'm sorry, not kids, nobody, nothing matters to me without her. He I, is the love of my life, always has been, yeah. always has been. It was time to leave Fresno and the world of meth. I hoped Diane found recovery. I also knew she came from a background where her use was in some ways an understandable response to trauma too awful to imagine. Meth can destroy lives and create misery, but it also takes root in communities that are already chaotic and under strain. It provides a primitive and dangerous kind of pain relief, going on to cause new pain across the generations. <laughs> 